Tonight we're going to be uh, continuing our study through Leviticus. I know you're all super excited about that. Woo! Leviticus chapter 19 and 20 tonight. Actually, the second half of 19, we actually went through the first 18 verses. And then we'll get through hopefully both chapters, but you know how that goes. So let's pray. I actually am excited to get into this, Lord. It is actually extremely humbling if we stop and consider what we're doing right now to actually be able to read the Word of God, the living, inspired, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. And so, Lord, I do pray for just hearts that would be open to what you want to say. It's a spiritual book. So I pray that you would speak straight to our spirit. And Lord, I pray that it would almost be like food that we eat or like water. It just re- refresh our souls like, like food and water does to our bodies, that we would feel that in our inner man tonight, God. We would just know we've been strengthened. Lord, even if we don't remember everything that we hear, we know we've been in your word. And so, Lord, most of all, help us to know Jesus better because we've been in your word tonight. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in chapter 19, like I said, and we're in this section that's the latter half of the book of Leviticus dealing with um, this idea of separation. Uh, Separation meaning separation from the world and separation to God. Another way of looking at it is just holiness, holy living. The grand theme of the book of Leviticus is holiness, the holiness of God, and the holiness of God's people. We'll talk more about that as we get going. Um, but we're going to look at chapters 19 and 20 tonight. And, and like I said last time, if a couple of weeks ago, at first glance, these chapters just seem like this shotgun blast of random unconnected thoughts and rules and regulations that God is just arbitrarily throwing out there. But upon further review, when you take a closer look at it, there's actually very, uh, not super clear, but if you, if you kind of drill down into it, you see that there's themes and, and ideas that he's weaving together. And he's touching on every area of our lives. Super practical, and one of the things that I think is most helpful when you think about this idea of holy living, and I'm bringing it up again because it's, up, it's coming up in the Word of God again, and it will again and again and again, so it's something that God wants us to think about right now as a church, holy living. Um, one of the things that's helpful for me is when I think about what he said in, in the beginning of chapter 18, I'll just remind you, God basically said, look, as they're getting ready to leave Mount Sinai and go to this land of promise, Canaan, basically God says, look, I don't want you to live like the Egyptians, like the people you just came from, and I don't want you to live like the Canaanites in the land that I'm taking you to. I want you to live according to my rules and my ways. You're my special people. And guys, that, that applies to us as well. We're the church. Did you know the church The word church in the Greek is ekklesia, and it literally, it's a compound word in the Greek that means the called out ones, and that's us. We've been called out, called out from the world and called to a relationship with God, and because of that, our lives are to reflect our holy God. doesn't mean we're perfect or we're flawless, but we live our lives differently, dedicated to our God. Amen? That's the idea of this holy living. So again, he's going to hit a bunch of themes. Let's just get cracking because there's a lot of ground to cover. Verse 19. You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor shall you wear a garment of clothes made with two kinds of material. Listen as I read to you from Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 9. You don't have to turn there, but this is kind of a parallel passage. You shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seeds, lest the whole yield be forfeited, the crop that you have sown and the yield of the vineyard. You shall not plow an ox with a donkey, and you shall not wear clothes of wool and linen mixed together. I don't know about you, when I read a law like that, I'm like, who cares? Really? Like, why is that in there? Like, you're thinking, I think I'm wearing an American apparel tri-blend t-shirt tonight. Am I breaking the law? <laughs> like, what's the deal? 
But the idea behind this law is this, this idea of mixture. What we don't know from just a naked reading of the, of the Bible right here, and the only reason I bring it up is because I had to study it, and I didn't know this off the rip, but the reality is, is that all of these things that sound so weird to us about mixing the seeds that you throw in your field or weaving a garment of wool together with linen or mixing like that, all of that was very rooted in pagan superstitions of the day. So in their mind, that would have, they would have probably quickly identified that. So there's kind of like a pagan worship application, but there's also a very practical application to this. When he says, look, if you're mixing the seeds that you're, you're throwing into the field, it's not going to produce a, a crop that's really to the best of its ability for either one of those seeds. Does that make sense? It's not going to come to, to, to full maturity in the way that it should. If you mix a linen garment with a wool garment and you try to weave those things together, you don't really get the benefit of either one, right? I mean, a linen garment's nice and breathable. A wool garment's nice and, well, itchy, but warm. And, and so it's like there's this mixture. It's just not fair. He says if you, if you try to plow your field with a donkey and an ox, that's not fair to either one of them. Because a donkey and an ox have two completely different, you know, natures. A donkey's going to be, you know, obstinate and dig his heels in. The ox is just going to be like, must keep moving, you know, just plow ahead. And it's going to end up breaking the neck of that donkey. So he says, it's, not, it's just not practical. It's not good for you. But guys, we also know that oftentimes these Old Testament pictures are looking forward to New Testament principles. And what should flash into your mind when you're reading texts like this is automatically 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse um, 14, I'll read this to you. It says, don't be unequally yoked. There's that concept. He's reaching back to an Old Testament picture. He says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. He says, what partnership has the righteous with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord or harmony does the uh, Christ have with Belial? Um, or, uh, yeah, just false gods. Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? Now, as Paul is saying that, He's asking these rhetorical questions that all demand the answer of no, right? Does, what, do they have any agreement? No. Listen to the words he uses. He says, partnership, fellowship, harmony, portion, agreement. The principle that Paul lays out that's pictured for us in our Levitical text is this, that as believers, we're not to be yoked with unbelievers. And the reason is, is that there can't be an agreement. We have different natures. There's no harmony. There's no fellowship. It's not like God is being restrictive and mean. Well, we're going to find out in all of God's laws, it's for our benefit. He's trying to save us. He's saying, look, if you link up, and oftentimes, and rightly so, that passage is used to talk about marriage. If you're a believer in Jesus, you have Jesus Christ dwelling in you. You have the light of the world dwelling in you. What fellowship does light have with darkness? You cannot connect with an unbeliever in the most intimate of ways because you have two different natures. So it's not like God's being restrictive. It's like God saying, I would spare you the heartache and the pain and the destruction of linking up with an unbeliever. But it, I don't think it's just limited to marriage. I think when you think about businesses or you think about organizations you link with, be careful, Christian, who you're yoking yourself, tying yourself with, because it's not, again, that God is trying to restrict you. He's trying to protect you. Amen? And he wants the best for you. And guys, I know I'm spending more time on this verse. I knew I would. But I, I think that it's, it's always a good thing to hear this because there's always young singles or middle-aged singles or old singles, don't settle on this one. I have a, probably a small sample size of ministry compared to a lot of people, about 20 years of pastoring. But in my 20 years of pastoring, how often I have seen this. When a compromise is made and you just are so lonely and he just seems like a great guy and he said he believed in God, but he has no relationship with God, and you love God, and you love the Lord, and you connect with him, and you, I'm not saying God can't redeem it. I'm not saying that guy can't get saved. I'm not saying that God can't work it out. 
But more often than not, what you see is heartache and brokenness. And it's unfair to both parties. Don't, listen, I'm not trying to be a legalist here, but if you're a young Christian, single or whatever you are, whatever age, I guess it doesn't matter, don't even toy with the idea of dating a non-Christian because you are setting yourself up for heartache. Now, if you are already in marriage to a non-Christian or in business with a non-Christian and you're linked up that way and you can't unyoke, don't unyoke, you know, unless it's a business thing and you're able to or whatever, but you represent and love and live for Jesus right where you're at. And you just ask God to do a miracle. But a pretty stern warning that at first glance looks like there's no application, but in reality, it's super applicable. God wants the best. And he's saying, I'm telling you, don't do this. Mixture, be careful of that. Well, verse 20 through 22. If a man lies sexually with a woman who is a slave assigned to another man and not yet ransomed or given her freedom, a distinction shall be made. They shall not be put to death. That's the distinction. We'll talk about that in a minute. Because she's not free, but she shall bring, excuse me, he shall bring his compensation to the Lord, to the entrance of the tent of meeting, a ram for a guilt offering. The priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering before the Lord for his sin which he has committed, and he shall be forgiven for the sin that he has committed. This is a very specific instance here. I mean, there's a lot of variables. If a man has sexual relations with a slave that's engaged to another man, but she's not yet free. Um, We could go off on a lot of tangents, talk about slavery in the Bible, talk about a lot of other things. But what I just want to point out is is that um, in that culture, the slaves really didn't have rights And so when it says that if this man has sexual relations with this woman, um, notice who's at fault, first of all. The man is. It's his sin. She is not held at fault because she is his property, in a sense, in that culture. And she had no covering. She has no way of, of fighting back or anything like that. He's held responsible, and God calls it a sin. And he has to pay compensation. And some have even interpreted that he has to now marry her, and the marriage for that other guy's off. He's got to take responsibility for her. And we're like, well, this is crazy. This is unfair. Listen, one of the things that I think is important to note is how wonderful God is because he's not condoning slavery. That's a whole other discussion. I think you can easily make the argument right off the get-go that God condemns slavery just for the very fact that man is made in the image of God. And right there, there's no basis for slavery. Um, I know Christians in the past have used the Bible to um, justify slavery, and that's just plain outright sin and wrong. Again, here I am going into a discussion I said we weren't going to go into. But the point is, is that what God's actually doing is giving that slave girl rights and elevating her, and giving her a, a, like, this would have been kind of shocking to them. It's like, wow, like, now the guy's like, well, she's protected, she has rights, God cares about the lowly, yes. And he's actually elevating that person um, in that culture. Verse 23, when you come into the land, this is fascinating, when you come into the land, again, that's a reference to the fact that they're still in Sinai in the desert, they're heading to the land of promise that God gave them that land in Canaan, and he says, when you get there and you plant any kind of a tree for food, then you shall regard its fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden for to you. It, it, you uh, excuse me, it must not be eaten. In the fourth year, all of its fruit shall be holy, an offering of praise, notice that, to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat of the fruit to increase, listen, to increase its yield for you. I am the Lord your God. So God puts in the law here some agricultural pro tips. He basically says, look, when you go into that land and you plant a fruit tree, you don't get to eat from the fruit of it until the fifth year. Now, you might all say, well, that's not fair. I planted the tree. I want to eat of the fruit right away. But there's some lessons here. What he's saying is, look, give it time. Here's the lesson that I really loved coming away from this. Well, there's actually a couple lessons. After the third year, the fourth year's crop, what what were they supposed to do with that? Give it to the Lord. It was dedicated to the Lord, honoring God with literally your first fruits. And there's a blessing attached to that. And that's a lesson for us. uh, Listen, how are they supposed to honor him with their first fruits? An offering of praise to the Lord. I like that. Because when we we take offerings at church or you give a portion of your income to, to the Lord, I really 
am firmly convinced it should be with that heart right there. It's not like, here's your dang money, God. It's more of like, praise you for all that you've provided for, for us. You know, when I start withholding, if I ever withhold from God or stop being thankful, man, I, I, get, I get pretty greedy and ugly and gross. It is so good for us as humans to acknowledge that anything that we have has been a gift from God. Not the universe, not good luck, not your hard work necessarily. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, our personal God who blesses us. It's so good to honor him with our first fruit. But another great application in that is that fruitfulness takes time. Fruitfulness takes time. It's as if he's saying, don't rush that poor little tree. (laughs) Give it some time. As it's sucking up nutrients, as it's being waters, as it's kind of hanging out in the sunlight, it also needs time. Notice what he said. I'm not restricting you. This is to increase its yield for you. It's actually going to be better for you if you give this thing some time. And and I just kind of came away with a couple thoughts on that. You know, I love how gracious God is. He's like, don't be so in a hurry to see the fruit. And, and maybe that's a word for you tonight, that, that you can kind of ease up even on yourself or on others around you. Give the tree a break. <laughs> fruit takes time. And guys, fruit is a natural byproduct of a branch abiding into the trunk of a tree. It's something that just comes with time. You can't force it. You can't make it happen. Jesus taught us that, right? He said, you're the, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Everyone who abides in me bears fruit. But guys, sometimes that takes time. So maybe you can take it easy on yourself. Well, how come I'm not this way? I'm not this way yet, and I should be further along. Relax. Just keep abiding in Christ because fruit is a natural byproduct of that. And then also maybe lay off a little bit on the person that just got saved three weeks ago and you heard him say a cuss word. What? Why aren't they completely fruitful at this stage? They just met Jesus. Relax. Give them time to just hang out with the Lord and become more like him. Amen? That's one, of the, that's one of our downfalls in the church, by the way, guys, is expecting so much from other people sometimes. The church at, at large, we've done this with celebrities a lot. We've done this like, you know, a, 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 some famous band member or actor or politician or somebody gives their life to Jesus, and we expect from that moment everything that comes out of their mouth better be right, and they better have all their stuff together and throw away all their dope and get every, like have their lives completely cleaned up because after all they've been saved for like four days. And the worst thing we can do is shove them out into the limelight and say, look, Christians can be cool. Here's our representative. (laughs) We need to like say to that person, pull back. Come and sit. Come and just be at church for a while. Get involved with the community of believers and just learn about Jesus. The fruit will come. Amen? I think that's why Paul says in 1 Timothy 5.22, Be patient. Don't just lay hands on somebody quickly to put them into ministry. There's got to be some proven time of fruitfulness, and time time is exactly what that needs, and time is what we're running out of. Verse 26, you shall not eat any flesh. Now, what I'm going to do, by the way, before I read that, is I'm going to read all the way through verse 31. It may seem disconnected, but there's actually a reason. You shall not eat any flesh with the blood in it. We've covered that. You shall not interpret omens or divination or tell futures or fortunes, excuse me. You shall not round off the hair of your temples or mar the edges of your beard, guys. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. Do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute, lest the land fall into prostitution and the land become full of depravity. She'll keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I'm the Lord. Do not turn to mediums or necromancers. Do not seek them out and so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord, your God. Another reason that I lumped those together, verses 26 through 31, is because these were all things that the pagan uh, nations around Israel in Egypt that they came out of, and in Canaan where they were going, these were all things that they were all involved in and they were all doing. 
Even the, the hair trimming thing in Jeremiah 9 and Jeremiah 48, he talks about how all these nations, and he names them Ammon and Egypt and the, these guys and those guys, they all do that. In essence, he's saying, you don't do that. It's funny, I, I was researching this a little bit, and I just Googled, and I came across some, like, Jewish messianic, not Jewish messianic, but like a, just a Jewish website about keeping the law. And it was all about like the length you can have. And they had like diagrams of this counts as rounding, this doesn't count as rounding, and this and, and all these like weird things. And I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. But again, um, that section, in fact, let me just, actually before I get completely into that and get off track, let me go back to the track for a second. Look at verse 26. 26. You shall not interpret omens or for, tell fortunes or and then look at verse um, 31. Do not turn to mediums or necromancers. Th this is something, I'm lumping these th two things together. This is a very stern warning. In fact, he's going to say it again at the end of chapter 20. A very stern warning. Do not get involved with the occult. Do not get involved with fortune telling. Do not get involved with astrology or telling, you know, do not get involved with tarot cards. Do not get involved with these things. Do not go to mediums. Don't consult the spirits of the dead or ghosts or things like that. And the reason he's warning against those things, he calls it idolatry and whoring after other gods. And guys, this is something that is very popular right now. It, it always goes through the ages and different names and different things and becomes cool. And, and it's very cool right now to be involved in the New Age movement and to channel and to be involved in tarot cards. And, and, be involved. and guys, here's, here's why God is against those things. Because it's not what you think it is. It's, it's got a very real demonic background to it. And you may think, oh, they're, they're just communicating with old, old Uncle Ed who died 30 years ago. No, he's communicating or she's communicating with a demon who is a familiar spirit, who's been around a long time and knows how to tell you things that you want to hear. And there's a lot of people that are just fakes and just, you know, doing tricks and making money. But there's also a lot of people that are very truly tapped into a very real demonic realm. And guys, here's what concerns me a little bit, is that as Christians, we need to not toy with this. We need to run away from this. We of all people on the planet are the ones that ha should have discernment on these things. We're not the ones that should be watching ghost hunters. We're not the ones that should be toying with Ouija boards or playing having anything to do with any of these things, checking horoscopes, all of those things, we should be the ones that understand, of all people, what this really is. And so be careful. Be careful. Don't toy with this. Because there's a very real demonic force behind it, and, and it's led many, many people astray. So be careful with that. Now let me, let me talk to you quickly about this idea of rounding off the beard, cutting the hair. Notice it's lumped in also with... Uh, cutting yourself um, and tattooing yourself. The reason those are lumped together is because, again, I find this out, not because I just have this information in my head, but in my research what I found is all of those things, from the, the cutting of the hair, the rounding off the beards, um, making cuts on your skin and tattooing. Notice this phrase, for the dead. All of those things were connected to the pagan deities of death, and then when they would mourn the death of somebody, they would do these cuts, these tattoos, these outward signs of mourning, but it was more than just mourning. It was actually kind of delving into this propitiatory type offering to the gods of death and, and the deities of death, very tied in to the pagan circles of, of worship. Does that make sense? And, and so, you know, I, first time I went to Russia, I'm in Eastern Russia. No, that's not true. So it wasn't the first time. About the third time I went to Russia, I was in Eastern Russia. And I'm doing these, these teachings in all these churches, and it's really cool. People are being blessed. But I had to answer this question so many times because there's a lot of legalism in the church in Russia. And I remember this one girl coming up to me, about 15, and she's just like, can I ask you a question through an interpreter? I'm like, yeah. I have a question about, let me guess, my tattoos. And she's like, yeah. Because I explained the 116 is a reference to Romans 116, and then I have my first wife, Regina, tattooed on the inside of my arm. And uh, she's asking me, because I, I told her, yeah, they're pretty recent. She's like, but in your testimony, you said you got saved when you were 10. I was like, yeah. But you said you got those not too long ago. Right. 
and she just could not understand how a Christian <laughs> could get a tattoo. And, and I had to explain to her and lovingly explain to her, well, here's the thing. Um, we're not under the law. You know, I kind of went through that whole thing. We're not under the law. And then tried to explain the context of this and tattoos. Like, so I'm not saying go out and get a tattoo. I'm saying, you know, if, if you're going to hold to that law, then, then you can't shave your beard either. And you got to hold on to every other dietary law. And, you, know, you know what I'm saying? There's a context to this. So anyways, all that to say, if you ever had a question about the tattoo thing, there it is. It was related to the mourning practices of the, the pagan nations around them. One thing I wanted to pull out from that as well is here they are cutting themselves, tattooing themselves, shaving themselves in this morbid, weird dedication to these pagan deities of death. And I couldn't help but think of what Paul said. Not to be ignorant that we don't grieve like others who have no hope. I, you know, being a, a child of God goes right down to the way we grieve the death of people. Amen? Because when we lose a brother or a sister who, who knows Jesus and they go on, they go on to be with the Lord. And we, we have hope. We get to see them again. We don't have to be crushed by that. We, we can just cry and be sad, sure. But the reality is we're going to be with that person again. Amen? I love that. Verse 29. Don't, uh, no, excuse me. I'm going to just go ahead and jump down to verse 32. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. When Steve walks in the room, everybody better stand at attention. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love this. He says, respect the elders. Respect those. It drives me crazy, you know, when you're in the city, not Lihui, but an actual city like on the mainland, um, and you're on a bus or a train or something like that, and, and a, an elderly person comes on. It absolutely drives me nuts when you have a 19-year-old with their headphones on, they're rocking out and like cruising, and that old person's standing there. I just want to grab them by their neck and rip them out of their seat and say, give your seat to this person. Am I the only one that feels that way sometimes? I guess I could give my seat too, but... I'm, I'm rounding the corner of old, so if, I, if my back would let me, I would have given them their, my seat, but anyway, just respect the elderly. <laughs> uh, verse 33, when a stranger, now this is great, listen, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, now the word stranger there just means a, a temporary um, inhabitant or a, literally a newcomer. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you. And you shall love him as yourself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. There's so much talk right now about social justice and treating people correctly and fairly with equity. And Here's God's heart on this. I love this. He says, when there's a stranger, and the word stranger in the Hebrew literally means tourist. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't mean that. <laughs> does not mean that. Just kidding. But he says, you need to treat the stranger as if that person is a native. I, have you ever been to a foreign country? Have you ever been somewhere where it's, it, you don't speak the language, they wear different clothes, the food is different, everything, the surroundings are different, the way they operate is different? It is absolutely intimidating. And the point what he's making is when there's a stranger that comes into your land, it would be very easy to take advantage of them. They don't know the exchange rate. They don't know the culture. They don't, you could easily get more money out of them. You could easily, just for the fact that their skin's a different color, you could treat them differently. And I, I love what God says. He's, he says, no, you treat that stranger like they're an actual native of the land and you love them. And here was his reasoning, because you were in Egypt as strangers. It's like he says, don't forget where you came from. Don't forget your roots, kids, because you know, of all people, should know what it felt like to be discriminated and, and shoved aside and taken advantage of so you treat others with love. That's a, that's a word for us, amen? That's a word for us. You know what the world is so upset about? Black, white, brown, man, woman, it all finds an answer in Jesus Christ. And the church has failed in this in many ways over the centuries, for sure. But not all of the church. And guys, what the world is looking for, we should actually be exemplifying. Because as a believer in Jesus Christ, it, it, 
does not matter how much money you make. It does not matter what color your skin is. It does not matter where you were born. It does not, none of that matters because we're all one in Christ. Amen? And shame on us if we don't live that way. And I think as a church, in this church, I think we do. And I hope we do even to a greater degree. But let's, boy, if, if ever the world needed to see the church at its best, it's right now in that area. Well, moving on, verse 35 you shall do no wrong in judgment, in measures of length, weight, or quantity. In other words, be fair in your business dealings. You shall have just balances, just weights. They would have these balances with weights when you're weighing out your, your goods or whatever. He says, don't put extra weight on there or cheat. He says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall observe all of my statutes and all of my rules to do them. I am the Lord. By the way, that phrase, I am the Lord, at least 50 times in this chapter alone, God reminds them, I'm the Lord. <laughs> Why should we do this? I'm the Lord. But how can we have to, I'm the Lord. How can we, I said so. <laughs> I'm God. Well, chapter 20, and I know you're thinking there's no way he's going to make it to chapter 20. Watch this. We, now, ch- let me just tell you about chapter 20 because we aren't going to read every verse, and here's why. Chapter 20 is revisiting a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about, here's the difference. Um, as it's dealing with like idol worship and sexual sin and things like that, what, what, what chapter 20 does is it's laying out the penalties. It's already been told to us that it's wrong and it's sin, but now he's laying out what the penalty is. And I'll give you a little heads up. 15 times in this chapter, he gives the death penalty. 15 times in this chapter. Because the wages of sin is death. And so let's just, I will just highlight some things. We'll read some things. I do want to look at verses 1 through 5. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Say to the people of Israel, any of the people of Israel or the strangers who sojourn in Israel who give any of his children to Molech shall surely be put to death. Now we talked about Molech, one of the false deities of the Canaanite people, worshipped by putting your child on an idol that's heated up and it would literally burn the baby to death. And that's how they would give their best to Molech. And he basically says, anybody who does that is going to be put to death. Verse uh, 3, I myself will set my face against the man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given one of his children to Molech to make my sanctuary unclean and to profane my holy name. That's not a shock that that's in there, but this is what is interesting to me in verse 4. And if the people of the land do at all close their eyes to that man, when he gives one of his children to Molech, and do not put him to death, then I will set my face against that man. In other words, I'll step in myself. And against this clan, and I will cut them off from among their people, and all who followed him, a whoring after Molech. The reason I point that out, I find that very interesting, is that God says the person who gets involved in that and does that wicked sin is guilty, but guess who else is complicit? the one who sees it happening and doesn't do anything about it. Now that hits a little close to home, doesn't it? When Pastor Steve gave out the statistics of how many babies are being killed in our country every year, I don't know about you, but I was weeping and tears were flowing down my face. Not in a condemning way to the women who have done that, but to the very fact that in our country we somehow think that that is okay. And we have people on the ticket whose political view on this is that, and I'm not telling you who to vote for, but I think it's important to understand that there are people who are now, I won't say the names of anybody tapped to be the vice president from the Democratic Party, but who believe that abortion is okay up to the point of birth. That's radical. And Oh, stop being political in church. That's not a political issue. That's a moral issue. And that is something that we as a church cannot stand by and say nothing about. And there's other things as well. You know, sometimes as Christians, unfortunately, we're just known for what we don't believe in instead of what we, we do believe in. And I think that's a shame. We should be known for what we do believe in. But we cannot be those who just stay in the shadows and say nothing and do nothing. Because those things 
like that are, need to be called out for what they are. And that's an extreme one. And it can go all the way down to stealing or lying or whatever, but, but I just found it interesting that God said, they're not only guilty, but in a situation like this, those who see what's happening and do nothing, I'm going to hold you accountable, God says. That's heavy, and it should be heavy. Verse 6, if a person turns to mediums or necromancers whoring after them, I will set my face against that person and will cut them off. No one really knows exactly what that means, but it doesn't sound good. <laughs> when God's like, I will personally set my face against you and cut you off. Go the other way. If that's what's going on. Um, Consecrate yourselves, therefore, be holy, for I am the Lord. He says, keep my statutes, do them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Uh, anyone who curses his father or mother shall surely be put to death. Wow. He just went, okay, I understand the Molech baby offering one being put to death, but cursing mom and dad? Ooh. If you've cursed him, he says your blood is upon you. Now from verses 10 uh, through 16, he gives uh, the, all the sexual sin that we went over in chapter 18. He kind of revisits that. He talks about it in adultery in verse 10. He talks about incest. He talks about homosexuality. He talks about bestiality. He talks all those things, and basically it's the death penalty. Look at verse 17. If a man takes his sister as a daughter of a father or a daughter or a mother, again, he's bringing up incest. And these are areas that he gets into, and he says, um, verse 19, oh, verse 20, if a man lies with his uncle's wife, has uncovered his na- her uncle's nakedness, shall bear their sin, they shall die childless. If a man takes his brother's wife or impurity, has uncovered her brother's nakedness, they shall, die, uh, they shall be childless. Again, um, Nobody knows exactly what that means. God's kind of the only one that can give that judgment, but he basically says uh, it's either death penalty or childlessness. You can read through that on your own. Verse 22. You shall therefore, actually, you know, before I move on to that, I uh, I, I went through that big section quickly. Forgive me for that. Uh, Look at verse 10, though. I did want to point this out. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. The reason I point that one out is because that should ring a bell. The adulterer and the adulteress were both to be killed. Deuteronomy talks about stoning them to death. And it makes you think, doesn't it, of of John chapter 8. You guys remember in John chapter 8, Jesus was at the temple, probably on the temple steps. The southern steps kind of went down, and all the rabbis would hang out on the steps. People would gather around. It was early in the morning. He's teaching. And all of a sudden, in the background, there's this scuffle and some kind of noise going on. I'm sure it just started off in the distance, but it's getting closer, closer, closer to the point where now he can't even teach anymore. He's interrupted, and somebody's pushing through the crowd, and lo and behold, it's the Pharisees, the religious ruler guys. And they're dragging with them a woman either naked or half naked, and they throw her down at the feet of Jesus, and they say, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act of committing adultery. Now, the law says, Jesus, that we're to stone her. What do you say? Now, the reason I point that out is because these guys were not actually interested in Jesus keeping the law. Does that make sense? Had they been actually interested in Jesus administering the law, they would have brought the man as well. But by the virtue of the fact that they only brought the woman, many Bible scholars have speculated, because that's all you can do at this point, is that this whole thing was a setup. Maybe one of their own guys getting this woman, who knows, to get involved so that they could drag her before Jesus and force Jesus' hand, because now what does he do? If he says, stone her to death and uphold the law, he's losing all the common people that are like, well, I thought you were merciful. But if, if he says, let her go, then they can say, well, you're not a keeper of the law. And they totally thought they got him. You guys remember what happened? They're pressing him on it. They're pressing him on it. What are you going to do? We got him now. And he just bends down. He just starts writing in the dirt. And they, they, Nobody knows what he was writing. Many have tried to guess. No one knows. He's writing. And they keep pressing. And he stands up and he says, okay. The person without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. I love the next verse. Because it says, starting with the older people, they drop their walks, their, their walks, 
they're in the preschool ones had walks, and then the older ones had rocks. And so the, the older people dropped their rocks, and then, then as they got younger, they went away. The reason I like that is because the older you get, when somebody says, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. If you've been around for a while, you're like, I'm out. Because you just know you're guilty. The young guys are like, I'm not that bad. I'm pretty good. And they're like, eh, no, okay, maybe I've done okay. You know, like they're still, they're all full of zeal and everything. And, and Jesus just said, okay, she's guilty. You're absolutely right. But the one who's without sin, go ahead and throw the first rock at her. Because that's the way it worked anyway. If a stoning was going to happen, the accuser had to be involved with the stoning. And it says they all drop it to the point where only, in the crowd leaves. There's only Jesus and this woman, this naked or half-naked woman, caught in the very act of adultery, deserving to be dead, uh, put to death. And the very one who did have the right to grab a rock and throw it at her and kill her because he was the only one who actually had no sin, says, woman, which was a very tender word of endearment, where's your accusers? No one accuses me, she said. And then Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. I love that story. The very one who had the right to stone her gave her mercy. She didn't say, no, but you don't understand. I was trapped. I did this. I did this. She, she, she was busted. You ever been busted? You ever come face to face with the reality that you are a lawbreaker? I've never committed adultery. I've never. Jesus did a very good job of taking it from keeping the letter outwardly to the heart inwardly. When he said, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I have say to you, if you've lusted after a woman in your heart, you're guilty. We're all lawbreakers. We're all adulterers. We're all fornicators. We're all thieves, and we're all murderers. We're all. You ever been face to face with God that you've, you're busted? No more excuses, no more justifications or blame shifting, and you just are face to face with God. I did this, and I have no excuse, and I'm guilty. And there's the one, the holy one, who has every right to pick up the stone and condemn you. And he says to you, and he says to me, neither do I condemn you. But you have to understand something, because if you're thinking this through, you might actually protest and say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. But she did do it. How can Jesus just excuse and, and, and what's he, sweeping her sin under the rug? That's not fair. The only reason Jesus was able to say, go and sin no more, I don't condemn you, is because not too many days beyond that, Jesus himself, in a way, took those stones upon himself. He was nailed to the cross for her adultery. He bled for that adultery. He had a crown of thorns for that adultery. He had a whip across his back for that adultery. He bled out for that adultery. He died for that adultery. They put him into a tomb and rolled a stone across the mouth of it for that adultery. But then he raised from the dead three days later, and he conquered sin and he conquered death. And now the Bible says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Don't you? Amen. Aren't you glad that tonight, because even as Christians we can sin and we can fail, and we can even come into church with a heavy heart knowing we've, we've not done well, we've broken laws, we've failed. But can we just praise God for a minute that the one who has the right to hold the stone and throw it at our head or condemn us to hell says, I don't condemn you because I was condemned for you. Therefore, be forgiven. Go and just sin no more. Amen? Praise God for his grace. <laughs> Praise God for his grace. Well, look at verse 22. We're going to wrap this baby up, put a bow on it, and send it. Verse 22, you shall therefore keep all of my statutes and all of my rules and do them. Now listen to this. He says, that the land where I'm bringing you to live may not vomit you out. There's a word picture. Do what I tell you to do so that the land doesn't hurl you out. And you shall not walk in the customs of the nation that I am driving out from before you. There it is again. For they did all of these things. What things? All the things he just listed. And therefore I detested them. But I have said to you, 
you shall inherit their land. And I will give, listen to this please, I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm the Lord your God. I have separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean, the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by beast or by bird or by anything by which the ground uh, crawls on the ground, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. Verse 26, you shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord, I the Lord am holy, and I've separated you from the people that you should be mine. Verse 27, a man or woman who is a medium or a necromancer shall surely be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones and their blood shall be upon them. Now go back up to verse 26. Well, actually verses 22 through 26. Let me just sum it up. As he comes at the end of this section, he basically gives an admonition and a warning and some reasoning. The admonition is, obey me. Obey me. Do what I say. And the warning is, if you don't do what I say, the land itself is going to vomit you out just like the inhabitants that are there now are getting vomited out because they have lived and done all of these things. He's basically saying, I know you're my people and I know you, I've redeemed you out of Egypt, but I'm telling you that you're no exception to this rule. You live a life of sin, you're going to get vomited out of this land. The thing that I love about this that I've been kind of dwelling on is this. What God really wanted to do was to get them into the promised land and bless their socks off. He calls it the land flowing with milk and honey. That's just typology of like a land of plenty, a land of peace, a land of rest that's flourishing. Don't you understand? God was saying, I want you to, I, I didn't want you to hang out in Egypt. I want to get you into that land flowing with milk and honey. Typically speaking, Bible typology speaking, that land that he's referring to, which is physically Israel, but spiritually what he's talking about is this place of spiritual maturity and fruitfulness and victory and abundance in Christ and just going forward in the things of the Lord and God's blessing and peace and joy and victory and all those things. He's like, I, I want that for you. What's going to hinder that? Your disobedience. You see, disobedience always short circuits the blessings that God wants to bring into your life. And when I say blessings, please don't misunderstand me. We're not talking about health, wealth, and prosperity. I'm not just talking about material or physical blessings. God does bless in those ways. Hallelujah. But I'm talking about bigger things than that, like joy and peace and fruitfulness and victory over sin and, 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 and just purpose and all of those real things that we're after. And s disobedience to God always short circuits what God wants to do in our lives. True or not true? I mean, we could probably just start. Let's just start in the back of the room and give a testimony of how you know, sin has screwed up your life. Okay, go. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Nathaniel, sit down. Come on. Um, we could all do that. Conversely, listen, obedience, excuse me, let me put it this way, Blessing is a byproduct of obedience. A life of obedience will be followed by the blessings of God. Now, I, I say that it's true because God, when you follow God's ways and you walk in his ways and you want to live a life that pleases him, there's just blessing attached to that. I do want to say this, though. That's not necessarily our motive, right? Oh, I'm just obeying so I can get the blessings. That's all I'm doing. You're missing the point. Whereas blessing is a byproduct of obedience, obedience is a byproduct of love. Why do we obey God? Now, I do want to throw this little caveat in there. I also think that the fear of the Lord is also a good motive for obedience. Just by virtue of the fact that he is God and that can be scary in a good way and we need to respect who he is. Who knows how much trouble I stayed out of in junior high because I was literally just scared of my dad. Scared of the consequences. And that's good, and that's valid, but you know what's better? Obeying out of love. When you say, no, I love my dad, and I don't want to do anything. I don't want to do anything against my mom or my dad because I respect them and I love them. I don't want to hurt them or break their trust in me. And when I get that with God, when I say, no, it's not like I have to obey. Like I want to obey because I love him. 
because he's been so good to me. Amen? Blessing is a byproduct of obedience. Obedience is a byproduct of love, and our love for God is a byproduct of his love for us. (laughs) To know him is to love him. And the more you spend time in his word, the more you go to church, the more you worship, the more you spend time with God, the more you realize who he is and the sacrifice he made for you and, 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 and his, his intentions for you and his goodness and his character. And you dwell on that and you know him, the more you will fall in love with him and the more you will want to obey him. Amen? I will say this, even in a, a want to obey him is still not enough. We also need the power of his Holy Spirit. We need his grace. Because we can want to and make promises all day long, but without the power of the Holy Spirit, we can't. Amen? Um, I- I'm done, but let me just ask you real quick. How are, don't answer out loud, but how are, you, how are you doing on this, on this holy living thing? Because if we're not actually walking this, what the heck are we doing here tonight? <laughs> You know, if we're, if we're studying this stuff, but it's actually not translating into the way that we're living tomorrow, or what are we doing? So, how are you doing? Are you, are you walking in holiness? Now, I'm not asking you if you're perfect. I don't want a list of all of the failures. I'm just saying, in a more broad stroke way, the trajectory of your life, the master passion of the direction you're going, is there a desire growing in you? to live holy, to want to obey God, to want to honor Him? Or is it kind of like, eh, whatever, I'm still going to do my thing. I'll cruise into church on Wednesday or Sunday. And I just think it's good for us once in a while to say, are we actually walking in this stuff? I'm not saying we got to go under the law. That, please don't hear me. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a life, though, that says, I love you, Lord. I want to walk in your way. I do want to live holy. Not by might or power, but by your spirit, by your grace. I want to honor you. Amen? Let's stand together, and uh, we'll pray and go our way tonight. You guys are, I love you guys, man. You, you came out on a Wednesday night to study Leviticus 19 and 20. Awesome. Father, tonight as we stand... We could probably do do a lot of other things right now with our time, but here we are. And I don't know about these guys, but I feel so full. I feel so fed. I feel so blessed just to be in your word, to hear truth. Sometimes it's hard to hear. Sometimes it's great to hear. But Father, right now, would you help us to just take an honest evaluation of our walk? Where are we really at? What direction are we really going? What's the real motive of our heart? God, help us to live holy. Holy, separated from the world, from the flesh, and separated to you. None of us can do that in our own strength. We need your Holy Spirit. Please help us. We want to obey you. We want to please you. We want to walk in a way that makes you happy. And and if the blessings come, we're stoked about that. But Lord, we want to honor you with our lives. Help us. We love you and we praise you. And we thank you, Lord, that though we couldn't keep the law perfectly, you did, and then you died, and then you raised, and you forgave us of our sin, and there's no condemnation in you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, guys. All right. If we don't get raptured, we'll be here next Wednesday. God bless.